on up front. Let's worship the King.
worship you always. Nations rise and nations fall. Jesus, you have reigned over them all. You never fail. You never leave. You're still the king. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Jesus, you have never let me go. Here in the fire, still I will sing. You're still the king, yes, you're still the king. Oh, you're still the king of heaven. You're still the Lord of earth. You're still the hope of nations. Mountain high, mountain high, or valley low. Jesus, you have never let me go. Lord, through it all, still I will sing. You're still the King, yes you are. Though the storm rages on, Jesus, you're the rock I stand upon. The wind and waves can drown my peace. Cause you're still the king. Yes, you're still the king. Oh, you're still the king of heaven. You're still the Lord of earth. You're the hope of nations you rule the universe you're still the God of mercy you're still the God of mercy you're still the great I am you're still the king of all kings your reign will never end still the king of my heart you're still the place where I hide you're still my father and no one is stronger you're still the Lord of my life sing it out you're still the king you're still the king of my heart you're still the place where I hide You're still my father And no one is stronger You're still the Lord of my life You're still the King of Heaven You're still the Lord of Earth You're still the hope of nations Yes, you rule the universe. You're still the God of mercy. You're still the God of mercy. You're still the great I am. You're still the king of all kings. Your reign will never end. King of all kings, and your reign will never end. Your reign will never end. No, your reign will never end. No, your reign will never end.
is enough I've been washed by your blood My past has been healed My future is sealed The cross is enough running how 
how we get those little side, I forgot what they call them, but like you want to stop and can't catch your breath. But then I realized I don't have to run this race by myself. We're not alone. And I'm so thankful that I'm not alone in running this race. I really am fighting a good fight. And why does he say a fight a good fight? Because we all got to know that we're worth it and so are the people alongside of us. His cross is enough. His death paid the ultimate price. But can I tell you that we get to live because Jesus is alive. We have a lot to celebrate today.
speak and waters crash upon the sand The oceans push and pull at your command You hold the moon and stars within your hands And all with just a breath the world began We sing God There's nobody like you God There's nobody like you God And there will never be do would be enough from heaven's highest place you reach for us my sin and shame forever overcome oh, the grave was overwhelmed by perfect love yeah we sing God there's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God. There will never be. God, there's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God. There will
focus on the do's and the don'ts of, of living our lives for Christ but there is so much to live for there is such an excitement inside of our lives and if we always look at the do's and don'ts and we're not looking at Jesus because Jesus is full of life he is full of life it's not that we don't get to participate in some things it's that we get to partake in him so we really have to shift our focus. What do you mean we can't talk like that? Yeah, but we get to talk like this. We get to call ourselves sons and daughters. We get to call him daddy. We don't get to use his name in vain because we don't want to curse the God of our universe. We want to speak highly of his name and not use his name for ill ways because it makes us feel better for the moment. It's because his love is alive in us. Jesus, you truly are all we need. So, Father, I ask right now as Pastor James comes to deliver us a word that the spirit of the living God inside of him will increase. That, Father, that you have touched and placed an anointing on his word. That, Father, that you will bring and touch his, his lips to bring forth the word that has been inside of his heart. That you've placed in there and stirred and knitted together perfectly to deliver to the body this morning. So, Father, we ask for ears to hear and eyes to see. Father, we ask for the whispers of the enemy to be shut out and shut up. That we'll actually focus intently on what you have for us this morning. So, Father, we thank you for the cleansing that we just received. May you pour out your spirit on us, Lord, in a great and mighty way. Cover us, Lord. Cover me, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
I'm not claiming sickness over me. But I do have a pocket of these old man candy right here that I'm gonna <laughs> gonna have one in my mouth while I'm doing this because whatever came in at the last cold front, I hope that today is blowing out of town with the new cold front. So because it's kicked my butt. Um, I don't. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So uh, I have, it's actually going to be pretty short. I only have eight pages of notes, and I normally bring about 14 or 15, so. But it's because I can't see, so I have really large print, so it's not scary at all. Uh, <laughs> I know it's sad. Uh, Psalms 114, I'm sorry, 141, verses 1 through 7. And actually, I mentioned this scripture uh, a while back, and it's been stirring in my heart. Lorinda wasn't lying. It's been something that's been planted in my heart a long time ago, and uh, I haven't been able to shake it. And I want to expound on it. Um, in fact, I could probably stay on this scripture 1 through 7 for a month uh, and not leave it. There's just so much there. But let me start. Um, Lord, I am calling to you. Please hurry. Listen when I cry uh, to you for help. Accept my prayers as incense offered to you and my upraised hands as an evening offering. Take control of what I say, O oh Lord, and guard my lips. Boy, we don't say that one anymore, do we? Uh, don't let me drift towards evil or uh, take part in acts of wickedness. Don't let me share in the delicacies of those who do wrong. Let the godly strike me. It will be a kindness if they correct me. It is soothing medicine. Don't let me refuse it, but I pray constantly against the wicked and their deeds. When their leaders are torn, uh, thrown down from the cliff, the wicked will listen to my words and find them true. Like rocks brought up by a plow, the bones of the wicked will lie scattered without burial. Um, don't you just love the way David uh, talks to the Lord? I mean, I think I've prayed this prayer myself too, but maybe way too often than I should. I shouldn't be crying out to him like I do, but he's real, he's honest. He's speaking to, to the Lord like how... Um, Maybe we should a little bit more often. You know, he's, he calls out the, the, the enemies uh, enticing uh, temptations as delicacies. He's like, I don't want to be part of that. Uh, and, he's, and he even asks, he says, Lord, uh, uh, let the godly strike me or let the godly correct me. It'll, it'll be refreshing to me. Anybody said that lately? No, nobody said that one lately either. Um, me either. Um, Y'all know Pastor Rick, right? <laughs> Right, he's, um, but this, this, uh, this word stirred in my heart mainly because of the word plow. Uh, the plow um, is the, the focus of why I brought this scripture out because at the very end it says like rocks brought up by the plow. And we've been talking about this in the, the youth group in Temple. I've been helping out with them over there and, and uh, talking about the plow, how the plow, uh, it, its purpose is to uh, take what's, uh, hardened and and dig into the dirt and bring things to the surface that don't need to be there and soften the ground and and that's really what spin on my heart um, do we really can we can we really understand rocks in the ground that need to come to the surface sometimes we have things inside of us that are buried in there and we, we're really good at burying things inside of us and protecting things inside of us and not bringing these things out to the surface in fact we we just want to be correct and we want to be polite and we're just oh don't worry they won't ever do it again they won't ever hurt me again so i just won't say anything this time and then they do it again you're like oh, i should have said something last time you know these these do bring these things out then sometimes it's uh, it's beneficial that you might not get hurt again or you might not hurt other people if somebody comes and and tells you hey you know that thing that you do or you know i don't mean this mean but i don't like that thing you're like oh i never noticed it would have been nice to bring these stones out a long time ago and would have solved a lot of problems right so the plow is a good thing it's it's meant to bring things up to the surface and uh God has used a plow. In fact, uh, the, you think God was really into farming because it, most of his scriptures have to deal with, with reaping and sowing and harvesting and planting and, and all that. And specifically with the plow, uh, the plow started out with what we, we, we commonly know as a hoe. 
uh, it had a, a little bit of a, a hook on it and the people did it by hand. But then after a while, they extended the handle and they made it to, to where they could hook it up to an animal or, or some kind of livestock and then they would pull it along behind them and it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, to the point where they had this scripture in Proverbs 14.4. It says this, without oxen, in the, without oxen, a stable stays clean. But, when, but you need a strong oxen for a large harvest. Talking about... Without, without oxen in a stable, a stable stays clean means that wherever there's oxen, there's poop. But the benefits of having an oxen is great because, uh, uh, you know, if you really want to reap a good harvest, then you have to do a lot of work. And everybody wants to reap a good harvest, but don't want to do the work required to get the harvest they need. They just want to reap. In fact, it's even easier if you just reap from somebody else's harvest. Let them do all the work. <laughs> Well, that's, I'm not going to beat y'all up. Um, the, the, the oxen, off obviously, is a, an animal that represents blessing. And the more oxen that you had, the more uh, a wealthy, uh, blessed person you were. You know, and of course, they used oxen to pull, a, pull the plow. They used uh, donkeys. They used horses. Uh, a lot of different livestock uh, uh, pulled the the plow, a donkey, for example, is a represent, represented burden, an animal of burden because it always had a pack on its back. It carried things for people. Uh, but it also did pull a plow and uh, a horse. Sorry, I'm spitting because of cough drops. Um, I hope it's cough drops. Uh, uh, the, the, um, the horse represented war. So if you had your horse, you know, this is where the... the the purposes come in of, of being unequally yoked. Let me see, um, what, what scripture is that? Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 6. I know you don't have that one, but it says, um, don't team up with unbelievers. You remember where Paul was talking about that, and don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Well, really, this is where it all comes from, because it's, it's talking about being unequally yoked. Um, comes from Deuteronomy 22.10, which you do have that one. Wow. You must, so you must not plow with an ox and a donkey harnessed together. It's not because the one, one oxen was, was bigger than the other oxen and one was smaller. The, the unequally yoke comes from this scripture right here because there's different purposes in the animal. So one is an animal of burden and then one is an animal of blessing. And, and I'll be honest with y'all, I know a lot of people that's trying to hook up their, their blessing to the burden. Or the burden to the blessing, or they're going to war, and you, you kind of get the idea. The unequally yoked is 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 this, but it's the purpose of the plow is to dig up and to get the soil ready for an, an harvest. And uh, whatever animal you chose to pull the plow was of great importance. In fact, uh, Elijah, I think he was plowing with twelve. Sets uh, our teams of, of oxen, wasn't he? How many was it? Twelve? Anybody know? I think it was twelve. And then, then whenever he got he got done with that, the Lord uh, Elisha was the one was plowing with it. When it and then he he, uh, he 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 got called by Elijah, and he had to burn all of his plowing equipment. and He followed the Lord, but obviously the plow is very important. And then how much you plow depends on how much of a harvest you're going to get. So you, you, the blessing comes from how much ground you're willing to plow up depends on how much harvest you're going to have. Does it make sense? Okay, I, I put this together last night, so late last night. That's not normal. I was really, I was, shh. I'm trying to give him an excuse, which is a guarded lie of why I'm stumbling through this. I did put that on Facebook last week, huh? Um, But the, the, another scripture that I really want to touch on, and this is really the root of the message, is Hosea ten twelve. It says this, it says, I said, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. Can any of us in here really say that we're content and happy with the harvest that we're reaping?
how many of us would uh, prefer a, a different harvest or a bigger harvest of what we have? I mean, I'm not saying that we're bad people. I mean, but uh, we could use a little abundance, right? Amen. So the whole purpose of the plow is very important because if we're not reaping a harvest uh, that we're, we're expecting or we want, then maybe we need to go back and figure out why and how do we get a bigger harvest than what we have. And the plow might be a very important thing because God obviously, as I said earlier, is all about uh, the soil and the condition of the soil before we even plant. So if we want to get a big harvest, then we got to go all the way back and we need to do a lot of pre-work before we start throwing out seeds, right? Especially in our lives. And uh, obviously we all know that the three different types of soils, right? From the parable of uh, the sower, he's, there's, there's uh, some went to the wayside. That's not really in the, the, the yeah, and then some went into the thorns and the overgrown, and then some went into the, the shallow soil with rocks in it. And, uh, and then, of course, there's the, the perfect ground, which is the chilled ground or the plowed ground or the, 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 the ready soil. And, uh, A plow is what does that. The plow is what gets it ready. The plow is the most important thing. And we're not really talking about farming. It's like where scripture says right here, we're talking about our hearts. Because if our hearts aren't ready, if we could come uh, here every day, five days a week, and never receive a thing, you just hear blah, 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 blah. And you walk out of here and you're never changed, you're never any, any different. And a lot of times that's where I really believe like worship uh, uh, is a perfect example of a plow that comes in and it starts turning our soil of our hearts. It softens it up and it gets it ready for this moment right here where I start throwing out seed. So there, but there's God's used the plow so many times in the scripture uh, in the, the, uh, the history of the Bible, he's had to come in where the people were hardened. The people were, were not ready to receive anything. Boom, he sends a plow into the nations he plows everything up, and then boom, if they're ready for a seed. Like for a good example of Moses, for example. Moses, he, he called Moses, I want you to go set my people free. He looked, up, oh, that soil's not ready. Boom, plagues come through, wipe everything out. Slowly, he's working that soil, working that soil, soften those people up to a point where uh, you can go through all the plagues, and each time to soften them up a little bit more to a place where he said, yep, they're free, they can go. John the Baptist, when Jesus came, I mean, we'll go through Judges, uh, every time that they would get hardened and, and start turning away from the Lord, he'd send a plow into the nation and change things up and turn them over. And then they'd draw back to him again. And he'd always have to freshly plow that soil. Then, then John the Baptist was, came in before Jesus. He was plowing the nation up. He was talking about repentance, which people didn't understand. And, and he was constantly turning that soil. And it's a representation of what we're supposed to be doing right now. You know, Dam Damon Thompson made a statement that I really love and it's talking about, it's really about clay and, and being a, on the potter's wheel. You know, it's basically the same principle. We're, we're stopped to be soft and moldable and pliable and shapeable. And a lot of times we think, well, our job is just to be moldable and shapeable, but really I think you, you heard this, didn't you, Rob? We talked about the importance of being on the wheel. If we can stay on the wheel, we can stay in his hands and we can always be changed and manipulated the way he needs us and that's really how we need to can, can, uh, look at this with the plow is the plow is what he, he's using to shape us and get our hearts ready to receive a seed do we can we identify what a plow is for us right now it says plow up the grounds of your hearts the work before he says now it's time to seek the lord we want to seek the Lord. We want to have a harvest. We want to have all these great things, but are we willing to plow to find it? Are we willing to do the dirty work that we got to do? Because it, in the Psalms 141, he says, I'm going to plow up the ground and I'm going to expose all the rocks and I'm going to tear up all these things. It says it's going to be like bones scattered next to the opening of a grave. Exposed. Not buried. Revealed. Opened. The stone's going to be pulled out. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's very uncomfortable because we don't want to go through this process. In fact, a lot of us come here to church and, and when we walk out the door, we're like, 
Oh, good. I didn't get poked. I didn't have to give any blood today. I didn't have to go through this process of getting hurt. I made it. I didn't give any, I didn't give anything. And God's like, if they would just allow me to plow them a little bit and turn them over because I need something from them and I want to plant a seed in them, but they're hardened. So they're so, they, they can't receive anything because they're so guarded and they're so protected. I think many of us have had an encounter with the Lord. But it wasn't, it's kind of like thrown to the wayside or thrown into the stony ground and it was just so temporary. It was temporary and it wasn't lasting. And I've, I've had those temporary moments where I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to do it. And the Lord comes in and he wrecks me and he's like, yes, I'll get it. And then like I, you, you're going home and on the way home you get that, oh, hey, look over here. And you get so distracted from that one thing, and it's, it was so temporary, but he's really, he's like, oh, I've got to run that plow through there again. I've got to do it. You know, the uh, Hosea 10, 12 says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Now, there's two different types of soil in this ground, in this, this parable. One of them is, is, we understand, I'm not a farmer by any means, but I did grow up on a horse ranch. And one thing that horses and cattle all do is they, when they go from pasture to pasture, from water trough to feed trough or whatever, they always walk in a line. And they have those hardened trails that they walk on all the time. In fact, I could probably go to the ranch that I grew up on and I could probably still find those trails because they have been packed down, they've been hardened so bad that they're, they're basically they're fallow ground. It's ground that's been packed on, been walked on. In fact, I have them in my yard where my dogs kind of do the patrol around the fence line and they walked on it. And in fact, I have so many trees and acorns in the ground, there's nothing. It's just completely barren. There's nothing that can penetrate that ground. If I had a shovel and a pick, I bet I could stay out there for an hour and barely make a dent. And I've got this, well, Otis isn't small, but he's just really fat. But, but they, the smallest dogs can pack down a ground so hard that nothing can penetrate it. And he said, this is the ground that I need to work. This is the ground that I want to break up. This is the ground, the hardened soil. This is what needs to be broken up. And as the other ground, of course, is the plowed soil. Two types of soils we have to have. I, couldn't, I thought of it like this. There's content soil, and then there's discontent to soil. One is a humble, contrite, plowed, meek, submissive, and the other one just hardened, unbarren, unproductive. In fact, I had a conversation with Michael not that long ago, and it made me think about this because we're talking about this happens in the church all the time. There's people who come in here all the time, and, and they, they're going through the motions. They're doing this thing week in and week out. Week in and week out, and they're doing the cell check. Oh, I made it again. Cool. But they're never willing to get to the place where they're contrite. You know, you know what the definition of contrite is? We, uh, it was actually in a next class this morning. It's talking about that. Contrite is this. It says, feelings of sh or showing sorrow or remorse for sin or a shortcoming. You know, it's not the fact that we have to be continually sorrowful that Jesus has paid for our sins, yes, but there comes a place where you're like, you're really contrite that you're, you're humbled and you're like, thank you, Lord, you're, you're, you're thankful for what he's done. Not prideful, not hardened, not hope he does it again. If he don't, I'm just going to leave. If he don't talk to me today, I'm gone. Common ground. It's the ground that gets packed down, walked on. By everybody and everything, and it eventually becomes so hardened that it can't produce. I think our culture is doing that to us slowly over time, packing us down, making us hard. 
making us weary, making us tired. But the Lord says, it is time to seek the Lord. Plow up your fallow ground. How do we do that? A.W. Tozer, he made a comment before. He says, There's, the church is full of what he calls, or of course, we're all supposed to be sheep. But he says, some of the churches out here are people that are in the church. I'm not dogging out of different denomination or anything, but so many people are so used to going through the motions that they're considered fattened cattle instead of submissive sheep, that they're ready for the slaughter. In fact, I, I started thinking about that, people who are going through the motions, that they never want to extend themselves. They never want to get uncomfortable. They never pray for anything else but themselves. He says, I need to plow that up. I need to soften them up because I need to open their eyes to see that there's a world out there that needs to be touched. That the world is a little bit bigger than what's right in front of them. In fact, did you ever get that page, to the lyrics of that song? Here's, here's Matthew's West song. This, this might hurt. You ever heard the song? What's it, what's it called? Going Through the Motions. Yeah, actually, come on, Tyler. Uh, this might hurt. It's not safe. But I know that I've got to make a change. I don't care if I break. At least I'd be feeling something. Because just okay, it's not enough. Help me fight through the nothingness of life. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day without your all-consuming passion inside of me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I had given everything instead of going through the motions? No regrets, not this time. I'm going to let my heart defeat my mind. Let your love break me whole. I think I'm finally feeling something because just okay is not enough. Help me fight through the nothingness of this life. The plow. In fact, I, somebody said it the other day, he said, that, I don't know why Christians believe that this is a, a safe, that Christianity is a safe life. It said the first thing that he requires you to do is die. There's nothing, there shouldn't be anything safe about our walk. There shouldn't be anything safe about, in fact, if you're not drawing attention from the enemy, you're probably not doing your walk right. If you're not making controversy in amongst your friends, then you're probably not talking about Jesus. It says Luke 9, 62 said this, but Jesus told them, anyone who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. The plow is the most important instrument that we have. And you go back to Hosea 10, 12. It says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap, reap in mercy, or reap in love. Break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord. Why? Because he wants to send some rain into your life. I think it's both kinds of rain, too. I don't think it's just the rain that comes from the ground, but he wants to rule in your life. He wants to rain abundance on you. He wants to rain blessing on you. He wants to rain mercy, grace, love. He wants to rain everything on you, but you have a part in this because you're responsible for the condition of your soil. And you could come in here every week, year after year. I've seen it. They've never literally opened themselves up put themselves in a position to receive, to receive the plow. It's not safe. It's not supposed to be safe. And unfortunately, God has another scripture. It says, God would not mock, be mocked for whatever you sow, you will reap. And I don't mean that's to scare you. But God... I didn't do the scripture earlier, but he says, Ezekiel, if you can pull that one up. 
and I will t give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. So I say, I'm going to play a clip here right now, and it's a perfect example of what I just ministered. He just wants to take out the stones of your, that's in your heart. He wants to use the plow, and he wants to run it through you. And it's not to humiliate you, but it's to humble you. Because if he can humble you, and he can get your soil just right, then he can plant something in you. And if the soil is just right, it'll grow, and it'll last, and it'll sustain you the rest of your life. They used to make fun of me for a long time because I always played videos on every one of my sermons. And of course, and since I grew up in a horse ranch, I always had horses in it. So I got both today. So here's the video and we'll end, we'll end on that. Can you get the lights, Big Josh? I was in a farmer in Devon, didn't I, by you? Myself among them, leaving your brothers that fine farm and saying yourself at this stony patch of unpromising ground, you fettle enough for 20 men. Well, with a gimpy leg and the drinking, and their pain, isn't it, that you drink? Uh, none of us could have anticipated an ending better than this. Makes me question the wisdom of the charity that urged me to rent you this place. Not only looking at you, my old pal, but that pretty little wife of yours. Thought you were a spark, she did. And now your son sinking into the self-same bog that's swallowing you. See you, Joey? Oh, you got the collar too? Oh, come on, boy. Walk on. That's it. Walk on. Walk on, Joey. Come on, boy, walk on. You'd be better off starting at a trap with the air and going down. Gravity's the only friend you're going to have today, young lad. Walk on, Joey. Walk on. Come on, Joey. Walk on. Walk on, boy. Walk on. Come on. Walk on. It'll take the whip to move him. Yeah. <laughs> 
You've got no chance, lad. He'll not turn over half an acre. Give it up now. You've done well. You've tried hard. More than a man and your father. Come on now, Mr. Lyons. It's a bit rough, isn't it? Well, he'll destroy that horse. I'll be over Thursday. Give you a day to close it up. You won't. I'm sorry, Rosie. That's a perfect scene to illustrate what I'm saying. If you pull out the plow, he'll send the rain. If you make yourself available, he'll do the work. And if you don't try to bury those stones, but when they come up, deal with them. Deal with them. We'll help you. Amen? I know it's kind of a weird word, but y'all be blessed. Y'all have a wonderful week. Um, and of course, if you need help and want to talk, we're available. Amen? Amen. Y'all be blessed. Have a good week. See you next Sunday. Amen.